My name is Erin and I am an alcoholic and my sobriety date is April 27th of 2020. Um, in my typical lead, I tell you what it was like, what happened, and what it's like now. And so in the beginning, before any alcohol or drugs entered my story, I knew I was different. I felt different. Um, I remember getting off the bus when I was a little kid. I was in kindergarten. I remember this vividly. And I was crying and my mom looked at me and asked me, well, you know, what's wrong? And I said, well, they don't like me because I'm me. And in my heart of hearts, I know that that was my alcoholism. That was the God-sized hole that I felt that I now know is a God-sized hole for me in my program. Um, things were really good. I had an amazing childhood. I grew up upper middle class. My parents made a very loving home. There were no issues. I was never immersed in any of the things that I eventually later went to go explore. And that throws people off. It throws me off too. I was not a product of my environment. And I, I, didn't, I didn't know what was going on. I didn't know why I felt how I felt. I didn't know what I felt, truthfully. And I wasn't a bad kid. I wasn't a good kid. I was mischievous, but really mischievous, really. And, um, but nothing stood out as early childhood. Um, my first drink happened very early in my life. I was nine years old. Um, I'd snuck out because all of my friends were doing it. So I did it. And we got drunk at nine years old. And I have an eight-year-old <laughs> right now. And I might, I might have an aneurysm if I ever thought about her acting out like I did. <laughs> I might die. Um, but that was my first experience with drinking. And I knew I had arrived. I knew that this was going to be the answer to all of my problems because I didn't feel less than, and I didn't feel different. And I felt like I could bench press a Mack truck. Um, it wasn't a quick escalation because who at nine years old can get what they, well, not what they need, because I didn't need it. Let me rephrase. Who at nine years old in a loving home, in a competent, non-life home could have access to that kind of stuff. So I started searching out the people and the places that did have access to that stuff. And at 13, I was drinking every weekend. Um, it slowly graduated into other things. Um, it's now that I'm on the other side, it's horrifying. I am horrified that a child, a baby, would actively seek out something to make them feel so different. But that's how it happened. So, and like I said, I, I grew up in a very loving home. I have a brother and a sister, and they're great people. They are not like me. My dad is definitely, he used to be a drinker. Um, he doesn't anymore, but um, I can't say he's an alcoholic because he doesn't think he is, so I can't tell him that. Um, my mom was always superwoman. She always made sure we had everything we needed and most of the things that we wanted. And um, I thank God for them every single day. 
because without them, I probably wouldn't have made it through high school. I probably wouldn't have made it into college. I didn't graduate all three times I went. <laughs> but, um, you know, high school was really tough. I went to a Catholic all-girls high school, and it was really, really tough because I stuck out like a sore thumb. And I didn't make an effort to figure out why I felt how I felt at that point. So I just continued to exacerbate my own misery for some odd reason. Now I know it's because I didn't have any self-worth, but we'll get to that later. Um, so I graduate by the skin of my teeth and my parents pushing and pulling and doing everything they can to help me just be a functional member of society. And by the time I graduated high school, I had a crappy boyfriend who was very, he was very unkind. Um, I had a pill problem. I had a drinking problem. Life was really bleak. Um, man, it was really, really bleak. It was dark. I hated myself. I hated everyone around me. I, I would pray at night that I would just not wake up. And then when I would wake up, I would be so angry that I woke up. I was just miserable. And so I did what every rebellious kid does, and I move in with the really crappy boyfriend. And um, things got better for about five minutes. And uh, just like pretty much every bad thing, it just kept getting worse because I was in the problem and not the solution. And so let's see here. By 21, I realized, oh man, I have a problem. So I quit the drinking and I quit the drugs and I am just... I'm so dry and I'm hateful and I'm mean and I'm miserable. Even in, even when I wasn't doing the things that were supposed to be causing me the misery. And, um, my then boyfriend, now ex-husband, we ended up getting married along the way. Um, we found out we were pregnant with our first daughter. Um, whew, this is a tough one. Sorry. Um, our first daughter was stillborn and I remember having this huge resentment at God because I was clean and I was sober and I was doing the right thing and I was taking care of myself and why would this happen? Um, I still sometimes fall into that, what, you know? And the whys, the why, you know, why would it have to have, sorry, why would it have hap, oh my goodness, I'm so sorry. Why would it have to happen like that? What could I have done differently? And I mean, this used to eat me up. And so, that tragedy is probably the worst thing I've ever been through. And I don't know. It being so, not so far removed from it, but being that a decent amount of time has elapsed, it's easier to talk about. The feelings are still the same. I'm not as resentful these days, but the feelings are still just the same. And I'm not even really sure if that'll ever go away. I don't know if one day it'll be like, oh, well, it doesn't hurt anymore. But 
for now, it, it still hurts and I still cry and I still think about my daughter and, you know. So after, after Lainey died, I, um, I went on like a three month bender. <laughs> and then, you know, I got sober again and all of which I had, I had a really tumultuous marriage at this point. And not that my ex-husband is not a bad person. We just were not good for each other. My kind of sickness and his kind of sickness, they just didn't play nice. They didn't play well together. We didn't fight right. Um, we just all around were pretty much set on not understanding each other because we always thought the other was wrong and there was no give. There was always just take, take, take. And I, I find that pattern in a lot of my relationships as I graduated to harder things and worse things. And it was just what I could take from people, just in general. So, sorry, tangent. I get sober again and I have a crappy job that I hate, a crappy husband that I hate. Everything in my life I started to hate again. And all while I, I wasn't drinking, I wasn't doing anything, I was just trying to be like the all-American girl. And um, so we decided what's gonna fix our marriage, let's have another baby. So we did. <laughs> and um, my daughter now is eight and she hates me, so I, I'm pretty sure I'm doing something right. Um, <laughs> she is the light of my life. And she just, every button that she pushes <laughs> makes me think, I get to do this today. I get to be your mom today. And as much as it drives me up the wall, I still have this place of like overwhelming gratitude because there is no reason that I should still be here. There's no reason that I should be able to do stuff like this. And I do, I get to do these things today. Um, so we decided, my ex-husband and I decided that we would be better to split up. And that, that was in two, let's see, our daughter was like three months old. So that was in 2013. And so, we did, and I moved back in with my mom and dad. Um, I started saving up money, and I had met this man that was going to make me feel better. You know, it's the common theme in my story is I keep trying to find these external sources to fill this hole, and nothing ever worked, nothing ever made me feel better, nothing ever made me feel adequate, nothing ever made me feel good to be me. And um, that's an awful feeling. And I put drugs and alcohol on that. So we separate, and that was in 2013. Up till that point, I never really had any consequences, like at all, ever maybe a speeding ticket here and there, but that was pretty much run of the mill, like normal people stuff. And so I met this man because he was gonna fix me. He was gonna fix my broken heart and he was gonna make me feel worthy. And he was just going to be all of that internal stuff that I needed. And like every bad thing that, that uh, quickly <laughs> quickly snowballed into a couple years of devastation. Um, I, I used to work in the healthcare field and I quit my job. Um, I started waiting tables again because it was easy, fast cash money and I needed that. And well, my addiction needed that. I did not need that. But it slowly progressed to where 
it didn't matter who I encountered and who tried to help me or who tried to just make me not hate myself. But hurt people hurt people. And it's like when you're cleaning up glass. You pick it up and you have all of the good intentions to get all of this stuff off the floor. But you end up cut. And that's what I was doing to people. I was the glass and I was just slicing everybody that came into contact with me. And it was really just me waging a war against myself and everybody else was just collateral damage. And um, so things escalate really quickly. Eventually I'm stealing and I'm lying and I am doing really awful things to get really awful things. And that's where my addiction takes me. That's where my alcoholism takes me. And some really ugly things happen. And I'm not sure, even sitting here, I'm not sure how I make it through, but I do. And hopefully I will continue to make it through. Um, snap decision judgments have lifetime effects for me because of the choices that I make or made, because of the way I felt internally, that will follow me forever. Um, I was arrested numerous times, um, more often than I care to admit. Um, I went to prison. I went to prison in 2019 and uh, I got out in 2019. I, I did a whole bunch of county time because they kept trying to give me chances. All of these people were trying to help me because I was well-spoken and because I can act sincere and because I will manipulate until I have no other choice but to change. And that's who I was. And it makes me really sad to think about it and not really ashamed anymore, but that shame and guilt, that is real. <laughs> that is so heavy. And um, so I got out in 2019. I went in at the very beginning and got out. Let's see here. It was really tense. I went back to my mom and dad's house. Um, and man, if love alone could have gotten me sober, these people would have gotten our entire town sober. <laughs> and they wanted so much more for me than I ever wanted for myself. And I'm not even really sure that I was ever capable of doing all of these good things that they wanted with how broken I was on the inside. And man, like I said, I, I came from a great home, a great, like we still have Sunday dinners and we still eat at the kitchen table and we just do that. Like all of the wholesome Brady Bunch stuff. And I love it, I love it today. When I was ripping and running, I hated it. I hated my parents. They were just trying to stop me from being happy. Insert whatever ugly connotation that I could think of to push me further away. That's what I would think. So then I wouldn't feel so bad or so then I wouldn't think about them. But so I got out of prison in 2019 Things were still really bad. I wasn't, I still wasn't committed to not acting how I wanted to act, when I wanted to act it. And I stayed sober for a little bit, not a whole lot, not, not a whole lot of time. 
Um, let me see here. So old people came back into my life. Social media is a terrible thing when you are trying to find the things that you want to do. It's, it's awful. It, social media was a bunch of my downfall because I had no control over my thoughts, over my actions. My alcoholism was running the show for a really long time. And um, so I was running around with old people doing old things. And um, I got really, really sick. And I ended up in the hospital. They didn't think I was gonna make it. Um, I was on, um, I don't even remember what it's called right now, but I was on medicine to keep my heart rate up because my heart rate would drop and they didn't think they were going to be able to get it back. And this is in the midst of COVID. I had no visitors. <laughs> I had no nothing. And I was in the um, ICU for five days. And then I graduated to regular um, general population, I guess. I don't know. And then they sent me home. And I don't know what changed. And even before I went to the hospital, before I was actually, like, sick, I knew that I, I well, I was pretty sure that I was done. I was pretty sure it just, I remember the last night, my last drunk, I had drank quite a bit and I had added some, I call them dry goods to it. It's threw some drugs in there and I just knew after I did all of the rest of my everything that I had that I didn't want to live like that anymore. And then five days later, I'm sick as a dog. And uh, in and out, it was just that time period, almost two years ago, was awful. And I am so grateful for that. I am so grateful that I can sit here today and remember how devastating it was and how horrifying my life was, how horrifying it was that I hated myself, how horrifying it was that I hated everybody else. And I sit on this side with absolute gratitude because if I don't remember what it was like, I'm gonna repeat the same things over and over and over again. And I don't want to live like that anymore. I don't want to be homeless. And I don't want to be hiding from the police. And I don't want my daughter to say, where'd mom go? You know, I don't want her to have to sit there and think that she wasn't good enough, that she did something bad so mom left, that because it had nothing to do with her. It was my inability to put down substances and it didn't matter what substance it was and I can look back on that and remember the heartache and the depression and the anger and the fear and I can remember all of that and say thank God I felt that because I know today I don't have to use a drink or a drug ever again if I don't want to. And here's, here's where my story gets really good. So I got sober and, uh, you know, life didn't magically get better because in, in my irrational mind, oh great, you know, Again, I remove all the substances and I remove all of the toxic people in my life and things are going to be great. Well, it didn't, it's not like that, <laughs> at least in my story. So 
I got a great job. I don't know how I got the job. I didn't deserve the job. Um, I'm a felon and I have an amazing job. And I work Monday through Friday. I got that right out of the hospital. And like I said, it, the stars aligned and the universe is met. And here, give Erin all of these responsibilities. She'll do fine. But I eventually did. And I'm thriving in this job today. So I get this really great job. And, you know, I start seeing my daughter again. And I get a car. I buy a car. The first car I'd ever bought outright with cash because I had a job that I didn't have to spend all my money immediately, that I, I could save up and I could do all of this stuff. I immediately got a sponsor. You know, I, I was doing all of the things that were suggested in the beginning that I just wasn't willing to do, you know? That's another thing I wanna to touch on really quickly. Before I even got sick, after my last drunk, I knew, and this is how I knew, that it was over for me. My desperation and my willingness were finally on the same level. And I knew the only way that I was never gonna feel like that ever again was if I had to change. And the fear of change was less than the fear of staying the same. And that's when things happen for me in my life. And um, again, I'm super grateful for that too. So, so like I said, I get sober, I get a job, I get a car, I'm starting to see my daughter again. Life is amazing in like the worst way possible because I'm still miserable I'm still full of fear. I'm still running around crazy, but I can't blame it on the drugs and alcohol anymore. So then common denominator says, well, you, you might be the problem. Man, I was, and I'm still my problem today because I know from my work with my sponsor and the people that I interact with on the daily, that if I'm not the problem, there is no solution. Because it was put to me this way one time. You know how hard it is to change yourself. There's no way you can change anybody else because you do it kicking and screaming only after you've been hurt so many times. So I was like, oh man, that was like an aha moment for me. Like, wow, maybe I am the problem oh man, I am. So, so that day I found out I was the problem. And that was a really terrible day for me. <laughs> and um, cause my alcoholism, it tells me that I'm less than, and it tells me that nothing I do is going to measure up. My alcoholism tells me all of these really awful things and it goes well beyond self-deprecating because, because the things that I used to believe are not funny and they're sad. But like I said again, I don't have to believe that today. And I know that working the steps has changed my life. I know that working with other alcoholics has changed my life. And I know that if I continue to do those things, and my sponsor always says, work with others, clean house, and trust God. And like I mentioned at the very beginning, all of these external things can't fill a God-sized hole in me. Kind of got Mr. Miyagi into believing in God because in the beginning, I, I had no desire to have any kind of belief. I had no desire 
you know, I'm not going to do the AA, God crazy, blah, 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 blah. Man, I, before I could, before I even had any inkling that I was developing a spiritual connection with God, I choose to call him God because it's just easier that way for me. Before I realized it was happening, it had already happened. And as I was trying to figure it out, I remember very specifically, and this was, this was during the Alcathon, one of my friends, I was just really struggling. I was really struggling. One of my friends, he was like, you know what? So what if God isn't real? Because you either believe or you pretend you believe but you have nothing to lose by believing if you find out that whatever you believed in the first place isn't true. So fine, you know, I'll start believing in a higher power and I will start praying to this higher power and I will, you know, cause he was right. I had nothing to lose by relying on my spiritual connection. And since then, my life has gotten so much better. You know, it's not perfect. It's not pretty. But it's mine. And I get to lay, not claim, but lay claim to this life that I get to live today. And I say I get to, I get to do things a whole lot because there was a time where I didn't get to do them. I didn't get clean clothes and I didn't get fed every day. And I didn't, I, I didn't get to shut the bathroom door because there was no bathroom door when I was incarcerated. All of these things that I get to do today are because I work with others, I clean my house, and I trust God. And I'm grateful for that friend to throw it at me so cut and dry. Like, what do you have to lose? I'm grateful for that because my life keeps getting better. I continue to work with other alcoholics and one of my favorite things, I do, I am a very big supporter of meetings. Um, I do around five a week. I love them. They're my little social network. They're my little therapy sessions. I get therapy for a dollar a day, you know? And even when I don't have the dollar, I still get therapy. So um, one of my favorite meetings is I take a meeting into a rehab facility and man, I am just, that's my favorite meeting. I take so much from that meeting because I am still that girl sitting in the chair across from me. I am still each and every one of those girls. And I re I'll tell this one tiny story. We were talking about something about, um, it was a really cool quote that I'd brought in. And um, so we're talking about this and I'm sharing a little bit of my story with these girls and I'm watching on their faces like, oh my gosh, how am I relating to her? I go straight from work and I work an office job. So for all intents and purposes, I look like I have my stuff together. I don't, but the look is there. And all of these girls on their faces are registering like, wow, I totally get her. And that's a miracle. And that right there is why I continue to work with others because being a part of is how it starts. That's where hope multiplies. When I didn't feel like I was alone anymore, when I didn't feel like I was the only one that felt this way or that had gone through this or what have you, that's where my spiritual life grows. Because when I don't feel alone, 
when I don't feel anything other than who I am, I can pretty much do anything. And that in and of itself is also a miracle because there was a time when I wasn't able to do anything. I couldn't take care of myself. I couldn't take care of my daughter. I couldn't take care of my backpack full of stuff that I walk up and down the highway with because that's all I had. Still couldn't take care of it. But man, my journey has been a great one. And like I said, it's not always pretty. Um, life gets really tough. You don't, your problems don't go away. They just transform, you know? So where one of my problems when I was out there was getting clean clothes. Now one of my Cadillac problems is, you mean I have to fold this and put it away? Because I have clothes today. But I know as long as I continue to work with my sponsor and honestly do the steps and um, just make action toward the life that I want, I don't have to pick up and my life will get better and my life will have meaning and it doesn't matter how I got to where I am right now, but it matters that I don't forget it. And it matters that when I'm fearful, I just continue to do what I need to do. And it's so simple and we screw it all up because in the very beginning, when I first got sober, all I had to do was just the next right thing. And I try and do that today still because I will add extra steps and try to manipulate this over here to get an outcome that I want, even with good intentions. I will still do that. But if I just focus on the next thing right in front of me, things get better. And today I'm full of hope. I'm clean and sober and I love the life that I have been given and I cultivate every possible thing that will be helpful for me and others. Not all the time, because it's not always that peachy, but I am willing to put in the work to make my life better today. And I find that very awesome and uh, I love it I love it 